Start it. Hello, doodlebugs. It's Mary Doodles, and this is a real-time video. Oh my goodness, that was so annoying. I'm so sorry. I um, I owe you for that one. Welcome to part two of Attack of the Dragon real-time drawing. If you missed part one, if you want to relive those memories, I'll put a link in the screen on an annotation. You can also find that link in the description below. Why not? Let's put a link to the actual time-lapse video too. So you can check that out first if that's how you feel like living your life. And if you're completely content with where you're at, sit back, relax, enjoy the show. I'll be lending my commentary on what I'm doing with the drawing here, as well as answering some of your questions and your comments from the previous video. Oh, was so exciting. Oh, I'm enjoying sparkling water. Hang on. Uh, to get started, let's recap on the materials I'm using. Watercolor and black liquid ink. Those are what I'm using for this particular piece. I'm drawing on watercolor paper. 140 pound paper, that's the weight of it. This pen that I'm using that you can see on the screen, I get a lot of questions about this. This is a dip pen, it's from Speedball. It's got a handle, the part you hold, and then there's nibs, that's the metal tip of the pen that holds the ink. Those nibs are interchangeable, you can pull them out and you can put new ones in, it's not hard. And they come with a different level of flexibility to get different effects. Um, you know, stiffer nibs have a little uh, less flow of ink as opposed to softer nibs. I tend to use the soft nibs because that's how I roll, but you know, to each their own. Oh my goodness, the sparkling water is the death of me. Oh, and this brush that I'm using with the ink as well is another one that people ask about. Um, some people mistake it for a pen, but it's actually a brush. It's a watercolor liner brush. It's got long, soft bristles, and that's great for pulling up watercolor, but I use it with ink and it's just as fine. Um, I recommend if you want to paint you know, fine lines like I do, find a watercolor brush that has very long bristles. I, I'm saying like maybe an inch long is a good length. And when you dip it in your to your ink, don't dip the brush all the way in. Don't get the bristles fully submerged. You wanna dip about halfway in at most because what happens is the bristles will suck the ink up. It'll pull it all up. If you dip it all the way in, that ink gets sucked into the, um, the area of the brush where the bristles are held onto the handle. You know, it's that metal band and the ink gets up in there, it dries and it just warps your bristles. And suddenly you get little stray hairs pointing every which way and it's not as precise of a liner brush anymore. So you want to take care of that brush as well. You want to wash it out after each painting or you know, after each session of painting if you're working on the same thing over a certain amount of time. Yay! Mm. Um, oh, and there's, I do want to mention, this is part two of the video uh, of the real-time drawing. There's gonna be a part three. <laughs> I was gonna do a part two all in one sitting and then I realized oh that's gonna be 50 minutes or so so I'm splitting it up again um you asked for it hey uh, and I also wanted to thank people for their comments and their feedback on part one um mostly because it was mostly positive and I really appreciate that everybody likes positive it makes them feel good uh but also because this is different. This is different from what I'm I'm normally doing. And um, anytime you do something different, it's a little scary. And I know that there was some requests for the real-time videos, but I wasn't sure how many people would be on board. It's really cool to see that a lot of people are feeling like they get something from it. So uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I get something from it. You know, I get the ability to practice talking like a human, which is really hard. I make pretty pictures for a living. Ugh! Sound effects. Veronica D left a comment saying, your paint looks super shiny, metallic, and delicious. Why, thank you, Veronica. Is this, is it just the glistening of the water or do you use shimmery watercolors? I ask because I have a set uh, of pan watercolor paints that are metallic. Ooh, I've never heard of that but they're pretty cheap and the quality seems not up to fine art kind of standards, but I still like them, but I feel kind of bad about liking cheap paints. Don't feel bad, Veronica. Don't feel bad. You follow your heart. You like what you like. 
you know, I, I grew up terrified to be the one in charge of the radio in the car because I thought people would judge me for what I liked. And that's not the way to live. That's like living in a cave, in a cavern, um, under a rock, not being true to yourself, You're waking up every day and painting your face or putting on a mask and living a lie. Uh, I've never heard of the metallic watercolors. I think the shine that you're seeing is the um, the wetness of the paint and the light that I use to lighten my videos. Um, yeah, but cheap watercolors, you know, here's the only, here's my thing about really nice, fine art style quality paintings and paint. Uh, that really is about preservation, I feel, um, and presentation to a degree. So everything is slowly decaying and dying, uh, as you may or may not know, and paintings tend to fade over time. Watercolor paints aren't going to be as vibrant as they were, you know, when they first are finished. So a lot of times museums, you'll hear things like museum quality mat boards or glass or museum quality paper. And really that's just saying this is something that can be preserved for a while and still retain some of its uh, beauty, its original beauty before things fade. Um, and that that happens, you know, because light hits stuff and starts to decompose more radically and get duller. Uh, some artists are really into, you know, making stuff that's going to last for thousands of years and some are not. You know, the, if you feel bad about it, think of the Mona Lisa. She's in what is the iron lung of art. She's in a little box that is very controlled because that is a painting that is very old and it's decaying. It's dying. It's going away. It's turning to dust. Uh, if you want to have a piece that's more preserved to give to your great, 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 great little grandchildren, um, look, probably look into doing like into higher quality paints. Uh, otherwise, like, you know, if you like the metallics, use the metallics, do it, follow that dream of yours. Um, you know, there are plenty of great artists who use Sharpies, which, you know, eat away at the paper over time. Graffiti artists put their works onto walls with the knowledge that someday, you know, someone's going to tag over it or uh, it's going to get painted over or taken down. You know, it's not going to last forever, but it's the material and the tools that you want to use. So no shame in cheap paints. Uh, Jess Express left a comment saying, I should paint, you should paint with red wine. I should paint. And there are 66 people at least who agree with her. Um, thank you. I actually, uh, spoiler alert, I've done a painting with red wine. It's not done. It's not posted yet. I'm still working on it. And the lovely and talented Dante Give Me Motion is writing music for that one. So we don't know when it's going to be coming up, but I've heard some of the music so far and it sounds really good and I'm, I'm excited and I liked painting with wine. I want to do another one actually. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, Lethal Chris Drawing commented saying, amazing video. Thank you, Chris. Loved seeing the development of the dragon in real time and your commentary is so awesome. He actually did say that. Thanks, Chris. I'm an aspiring artist. Ooh, no, you, I think you're a real artist. I've seen your YouTube channel. And I think I sometimes get a bit too technical with my drawings. I usually aim for realism, but I would love to find a more relaxed style. Instead, I sometimes find myself spending far too much time on one drawing. Thanks for posting this. Looking forward to the next part. Thank you, Chris, for commenting. And uh, I completely know how you feel. Um, I am constantly looking for that my style and at the this moment in my life I do want to simplify it I feel like realism is a very important step in becoming a cartoonist and an artist um, it's almost like knowing the rules before you can break the rules cartoons are an exaggeration of real life so understanding realism can help you with your cartooning but it's that process of stepping back from realism and relaxing a little more. You know, once you spend all that time working that muscle, you know, if you if you lift weights, anybody who lifts weights and does sports like that, you you know, you, you break your muscles pretty much so that they rebuild themselves stronger. 
but they're going to be a little bit stiffer. And so you got to work on stretching and relaxing them. Uh, and you go back and forth between tensing up and relaxing. So uh, to relax that style, I like to challenge myself or play little games. You can do things in your sketchbook and in final paintings where you limit yourself. You say, I only have five minutes to draw this character, or I only have one color I can use and no tones, or stuff like um, maybe draw a character only using shapes, very geometric shapes, and um, you'll get a more minimal uh, final product. And that might not be the style that you want, but you know, if you shoot all the way to the right and do very realistic stuff, shoot all the way to the left and try something very cartoony and very loose and very simple and then try to pull it both into the middle to find that happy middle ground that you're satisfied with. You know, it's sometimes it just takes random little exercises that are never meant to be seen, but it kind of shakes you up and gets you thinking and drawing in a little different way. Um, Raffi here commented saying, asking, to be an artist, do you have to have natural talent or can I just learn it from school? <sighs> Sorry, I just yelled. Um, I would say you can learn that from school. Here's the, the T word, the talent word. I feel weird about that word. It's not uh, we have a relationship. We see each other at the farmer's market. We don't make eye contact. And we just kind of go about our way and avoid one another. Talent, to me, is very confining. It makes it sound like this is a preordained thing. You are Arthur, and only you could pull the sword from the stone. And that's not what it is. I think it really is more uh, a predisposition or a tendency, a natural tendency to behave in certain ways or to be drawn to particular things and from that natural tendency you do it enough to develop a skill um so i guess it, it would be a more organic skill that is developed talent is a much more organic skill that you developed as opposed to sitting down and saying i can't do this but i'm gonna learn um which is very possible to do i like to think of it like dogs i compare people to dogs because in a way dogs are much more simplified versions of people, kind of. So some dogs are predisposed to certain things. We had golden retrievers growing up, and both dogs, when they were puppies, had a tendency to run after things that you throw. Uh, and they're golden retrievers, so it's in their, their bloodline to retrieve. Um, and yes, dogs are all bred to do certain things. That's We're not going to talk about eugenics today. That's a different topic for a different day. But um, So they're predisposed to going after these sticks. They're not born knowing how to play fetch, but they like to do the same things and the same actions that are used in the game of fetch. So with training and practice, they will be able to learn fetch and they'll be able to pick it up faster or figure it out on their own faster. I think artists to a degree tend to have some of the same tendencies. Um, they tend to observe their world a little more they're more content with sitting and taking things in they're also um, more into using their hands i have noticed i'm a fidgety person i think my hands have anxiety and if they're any bit as fidgety now as they were when i was a kid no wonder i picked up pencils and started scribbling and doodling <laughs> no wonder i my hands always have to be doing stuff I think a lot of talent really just stems from people being predisposed to doing certain things and that pulls them in certain directions. You know, it's not just art that your tendencies would lend to. It could be music. It could be crafting. Um, I find it very interesting. A lot of science-minded people are also really into music. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's a lot of crossovers there. You can definitely go to school and learn how to make art. It's not impossible. Uh, L. Loyette says, you should totally do a podcast. Oh, thank you. You'd be amazing at it. Thank you. I don't know what the podcast would be about, but you'd be good at it. Thank you. Do you still think I'd be good at it? <laughs> 
Uh, Ryan Jonestown says, why make a big deal about burping? Who gives a shit if you burped? By the way, the only reason anyone knew you burped is because you felt the need to talk about it for 30 seconds, which is very annoying. I'm sorry. You just really came across as extremely stuck up. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, quick judgment. You are the fastest opinion in the West. Um, I'm new to this whole format of video and I'm very conscious of this microphone. It's right here. And I feel like here, can you hear this? I'm drinking into the mic and into your ears. So yeah, getting a feel for getting the feel for the room, testing what I can do, how loud I can yell and all that fun stuff. Um, speaking of burps, if you want me to talk about burps more, I had Portuguese sausage for breakfast. It was so good. And every time I burp, it comes back. Not like the actual food, but the taste, the flavor. So I get to, it's, it tastes so good. Only to me. I'm enjoying it. I'm uh, just going back and reliving that meal. I can't get over it. I also can't talk to friends because, well, my burps smell like my breakfast. Cat Rance says, I'm glad I'm not the only one that messes up the inking process and then covers it up with thicker lines. Yes. The best trick for traditional artists. Thank you for noticing that, Cat Rance. Um, that is something that I do. I love fudging my way through paintings. I think that's a very good skill, especially if you want to be the kind of artist who does stuff like comics and cartooning or even design. Um, the type of jobs where you need a quick turnaround. If you're doing fine art, if you're writing a novel, you can spend a lot of time. You could spend months, you could spend years on a piece and slowly do it perfectly. And if that's your cup of tea, that is your cup of tea. Um, uh, I do find there's a lot of artists, a lot of working artists take jobs and do the kind of art that has that quick turnaround and if you keep restarting because you fudged one little thing and it's not perfect then you you miss deadlines and you spend way too much time working on something so being able to see your mistakes and then figure out how to work it in and make it you gotta make it work make it work kid that's a great skill to have and that's something that I have uh, inadvertently been practicing for a while because I make a lot of mistakes <laughs> And that's just how it goes. Um, David Gillum asks uh, or says, I found it interesting what you said about abstract versus analytical minds. I find depending on what subject it or on what the subject is, I can be both abstract and analytical. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's, you know, there's a switch back and forth. You know, some people can do it better. Some people can be analytical at one point and then think more abstract at another some people kind of end up in the realm of just analytical or just abstract. And the, that's completely fine, too. You can be creative in both of those worlds. Ah, there was my friend Lloyd, Epic Lloyd of the Epic Rap Battles. That is a human being. I've seen him flip-flop from analytical to abstract very nicely. He can do the the business mind. He can manage things and then get on stage and be wonderfully creative and free and liberated in expression. And it blew my mind. I used to work for him at his theater, uh, the Westside Comedy Theater in Santa Monica. I was doing the box office in exchange for free classes. And he was my boss. And he's like, he was probably one of the best managers I ever had, which is incredible. And yet he also had the skills to to do improv and comedy on that stage. So it's quite possible to be a day walker, be both, both, be the best of the both. Um, let's see. Sydney Claspiel, Claspiel commented saying, I have been thinking of visiting the Art Institute here in my city, but I'm afraid of making a career as an artist that it wouldn't that I wouldn't do well even if I knew it would make me happy I would rather be happy than make a lot of money oh yeah that's I find a lot of young artists have a hard time with that and young people in general young people oh, what a weird thing to say I'm getting so old yes when I 
was looking at colleges to go to, it felt like it was the most important decision in the world. And yes, it does affect your life. It, it is something, you know, that an event that cr- creates an outcome, many outcomes for you, but there isn't just one. So it's, it's both important and not important, if that makes any sense. You're not locked into your decision. I think that's the thing people fear the most because you hear so many horror stories from adults who are just wanting the best for you, but also want to ward you off from making bad decisions that they made or their friends made. People tell you, well, choose your major carefully because you could switch majors, but then you'll be stuck in school for so long and it will be really expensive. You don't want to be that person that's flippy floppy changing majors. And you don't, but at the same time, you don't want to be locked into that one thing and realize that it's not at all what you wanted it to, you know, to do. You didn't want to do that. And that can happen to anybody. That happened to me multiple times. So I think you have the right attitude that if you're doing what you want to do and what makes you happy, then the money isn't the issue. Um, it's it's a tricky, tricky thing. I don't know, career advice is hard because each person is different. Some people are more ambitious than others. Uh, there's that quote that's saying, you know, do what makes you happy and the money will come later. And that that's true to a degree. But the money doesn't just come later. I think what happens is if you're ambitious and if you're doing what you love, you find that way to get the money to come in toward you, whether it's getting paid for doing what you love or doing that day job that will make you comfortable and happy enough to then do what you love on the side. Um, so I would say, yeah, that, that's tough. If you want to do art, the cool thing about art is you can do it on the side very easily. And, uh, you know, then setting yourself up for a supplemental job or a way of making money that isn't sucking all of your time out and sucking your soul. Um, so yeah, it's, that's a tough one to answer. Focus on your happiness. Just focus on your happiness, man. And it'll all come together. But don't sue me if it doesn't work out. <laughs> that's the worst advice ever. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about that one. Uh, I wish I knew. I wish I knew how to make it work. Because this whole thing is a phenomenon. The, the fact that, like, I'm making money on YouTube right now. That's pretty much my, my main source of income. When I was graduating high school, there was no YouTube. This, was, this wasn't here. My guidance counselor couldn't say, oh, well, you, you should just be a YouTuber because that didn't exist. So I think, you know, part of it was I, I stumbled into it and ended up surrounded by people who could help me, you know, get into it or put it on my radar. But then the other, on the other hand, it's about recognizing opportunities or trying to find the opportunities or see the potential of a situation. There's paths and then there's less traveled paths. What? Ugh, enough cliches. All right. Uh, We got a question from Princess Horseradish, Your Majesty. It was a little weird hearing you struggle to string together coherent thoughts for 40 minutes. (laughs) Oh, yeah. It's weird for me too. Trust me, princess. My princess. And occasionally use a word where I'm pretty sure you were reaching for a different one. Oh, that happens. But I did appreciate your honesty, your advice, and just your own personal brand of strangeness. It's copywritten, so please do not steal my recipe. I really enjoyed it. It was really nice to watch this in real time and take a peek behind the curtain to see what really goes into making one of your paintings. I'm more impressed with your work. I'm looking forward to part two. Thank you, your majesty, Princess Horseradish. I'm at your service. Yeah, uh, sentences, not my forte. So this is... I want to show the real-time paintings uh, to help other people. This is from me to you, but it's also for me. Uh, as an artist, I spend a lot of my time at home alone. Isolation. It's not good for anybody. Uh, or I'm editing at home alone. It's not good for my posture. 
Um, so I'm always looking for opportunities to try new things. And I've, I've never been a good speaker. I've never been that articulate. And I'm, so I'm in the market for trying new stuff. I could always take an acting class, I guess. But this is, this is a whole new adventure. And I can do it at home alone. It's not the end all be all. But uh, that, that would be my advice to anybody who is doing art and creativity. Uh, when you're in school, it's a little bit easier because you have classes and there's a lot of forced interaction. But once you get thrown out into the ocean with all the other fish, um, the ocean is really, really big and all those fish are spread out and suddenly you're swimming through your art career or your creative career all by yourself. And it's like uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, no, this is a better metaphor. If you read if you read Game of Thrones, minimal spoilers here. Um, there's wargs, and those are the people who can project their consciousness into animals and see through the animal's eyes and sometimes control them. And wargs have been known, they talk about the way that they get lost in the animal. And they almost want to live this other life rather than their own, and they forget to feed their, their real human body, and they you know, forget to take care of themselves because they're just lost. And I feel like a lot of artists can fall into that habit. I'm sure George R. R. Martin was feeling that. And maybe that's a reason why that was written into the books. Um, our authors spend a lot of solitary time at their work, at their craft. And if you get sucked in, you might not take care of yourself. You might not feed yourself. You might feed yourself too much of the wrong thing, not get exercise, start hunching over and having bad posture. I'm starting to stretch my back now because I'm thinking about it. Oh, God. I'm just turning into a blob. So, um, yes, I'm kind of looking forward to doing some more talky talky video thingies. That was a big long rant out of a little tiny comment. Uh, final comment from Jonathan Snyder. I appreciate you mentioning the part where you see a painting or some kind of art piece and what you're looking at is the finished product and that is it. The viewer doesn't realize the amount of time and effort it took to accomplish it or all the mess ups along the way. I thank you for telling it like it is, like it really is. And also warning those artists who want to be at a certain skill level and are not to not get depressed, but press on. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Uh, he continues saying, I remember when I would spend hours on an art piece and when someone looks at it, they tell me how talented you are or, oh, gee, I could never do that. All I can do is stick figures. He <laughs> he. Oh, <laughs> I feel the same way. These people annoy me and the word talented now has a dirty feeling to me like I didn't earn it, that I'm just gifted and that there's no process of learning to get better. Sorry for the rant, DFTBA. Nerd Fateria. Awesome. Thank you uh, for that comment, Jonathan. And yeah, I I couldn't agree more. Ugh, the, the talent word is so strange. You make a really interesting point that that almost takes away all of the hard work saying, oh, you're just talented as if, oh, you just got blessed by a wizard. You know, that kind of discredits all the effort that somebody puts into it. And uh, the, um, the stick figure thing, talking with other artists, I realize that's something that a lot of people get when I, from personal experience, when I tell people I'm an artist or they see my work, the response usually is, oh, here's a compliment. And I can't even draw a stick figure. That is it's such an awkward thing to respond to, especially when you're face to face. Like, what do I say? I My default reaction is to go into art teacher mode. Oh, if you can write, you can draw. And then they're looking at me like, I, I wasn't looking for encouragement. I just was making a self-deprecating joke. Sorry. So, um, on the other hand, I, I get like, we're, we're all just uncomfortable human beings trying to sling compliments without being creepy and trying to accept compliments without being uh, vain and awful. So thank you for your comment. And thank you, everybody, for your comments and your questions. Um, we're going to continue this in part three. And um, that will be the part where we ink the kitty and wrap it up, as they say in Paris. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, until next time, goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Here's an annoying musical goodbye.
as hands.